You're listening to the Banana Data Podcast, a podcast hosted by Data IQ. I'm Trevaney. And I'm Will. And we'll be taking you behind the curtain of the AI hype, exploring what it is and what it isn't capable of. Today, we're sitting down with Karen Howe, Senior AI Researcher at MIT Technology Review, to discuss the ways we report and read about AI in the media. Trevaney, how do you learn about AI? Oh, man, wow. I read news articles, right? Like the kind of stuff that we talk about here. I read research papers. I I guess I talk to you and then I learn stuff. Well, that's, that's flattering. Thank you, Trevaney. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say the same. One thing I'm super into too are newsletters, like email newsletters to kind of do a, a digest. So I guess I'm trusting the subscribers to kind of curate the news for me. But I think it's a theme of this podcast, kind of enablement and enablement and upskilling around AI. And something I think a lot about when I'm trying to learn about AI is the distinction between learning AI and learning about AI, right? So learning AI, I mean, going in and reading academic papers, trying to understand the code, the math, whereas learning about, I'll describe that's just like reading the news, understanding what applications are, what the headlines are, but not actually getting into the weeds. Yeah, and there is a whole new field around AI reporting, right? You know, there's lots of newsletters and sections within a lot of online mags and all of the same, all the like. And so I think that it's not hard to learn about AI, but it is hard to learn about it in a way that is actually like useful and not like hyped up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Overhyping AI is definitely a theme of the Banana Data podcast. I think that in general, when there's anything that's both exciting and novel and fairly technical, there's the risk that you can be duped by some media that's not trustworthy. So I think another interesting element in this conversation is how do you develop trust and how as a reader, I you know give my trust to certain AI media? Yeah, well, I think trust can't just be one sided that, OK, like I trust that the reporters are giving me the right information, but also that the reporters themselves can trust that the public is willing to at least like try and understand what they're talking about and yeah. not just like draw crazy conclusions. Yeah, a fair exchange is kind of a two-way exchange where you as a reporter should be, you know, doing justice to the actual math, the actual application of the AI. But we do, again, another theme of our podcast. I think we're demanding on our listeners. And I think it's true that listeners of a podcast or readers of AI journalism, they should be a little bit demanding on themselves to actually read and actually try to understand a little bit at least what's going on at the core. Yeah, totally. So with us today is someone whose work I really like and have referenced on the show a few times. We have Karen Howe, who is a senior artificial intelligence reporter at MIT Technology Review. So welcome to the show, Karen. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Well, just to kick us off, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself or maybe how you came to be senior artificial intelligence reporter? I was promoted from artificial <laughs> intelligence reporter. Great. <laughs> yeah, I actually had a really interesting journey into journalism. So I majored in engineering in college and worked in tech as my first job before I entered the journalism industry. The reason was very much prompted by my experience in my first job, being in Silicon Valley in the heart of it all, and realizing that as a very mission-driven person who likes working on long-term socially minded problems, being in a very hyper-capitalistic <laughs> setting is not always the best way to do that. And so I was sort of soul searching after post-college uh, about what I wanted to do. And I'd always loved writing, wanted to be a writer and thought maybe I should try journalism. And because of my background in, in tech, it became pretty easy for me to go into tech reporting and then very quickly into artificial intelligence reporting because AI is so, it's such a vast subject and it's so, it's such a great, rich way to engage with both tech and society, which is what I like to occupy. So that's how I journeyed my way over. So on that point, you have some great work recently about criminal justice and recidivism. What do you think or do you think you have responsibility as a journalist to kind of be ethical and promote what we talk a lot about on this podcast, which is responsible AI? Is that a focus of yours? Definitely, definitely. So as a journalist, I think my responsibility is really to educate people that things like this happen. A lot of people don't even know that AI is used in the criminal justice system, and that's the first baseline thing mm -hmm. that I should I should do as a journalist is tell people that 
But going back to the fact that I have an engineering background, uh, one of the things that I really try to do in my writing is approach stories where I can uniquely offer kind of a bridge between more technical concepts to more social concepts. So with the criminal justice story, which is like a good example of this, I was trying to bridge the divide between two separate conversations that were happening. One happening in the social justice and advocacy world, which is AI is being used in criminal justice. Like this is terrible. The other happening in the AI research world, which is, oh, well, algorithms, like we can make fairer algorithms and they'll be less biased than human judges. And that's great. So I wanted to kind of show both sides of this debate that's happening, what this actually looks like. If we were to visualize how an algorithm works and the context in which it's being placed and like the history around it and the social consequence around it, can you actually build a fair algorithm and how does it actually affect the defendants that this algorithm is being used on? Yeah. So that's, that's kind of like how I think about my response to that as a journalist in, in upholding ethical use of AI is really trying to drive that point home. Yeah. And I think relatedly, you know, there's a lot of misinformation about AI and a lot of different sort of fears and maybe over promises. You know, we talk a lot about the hype cycle of AI. How do you see the role of, you know, a journalist like yourself or even generally the media at large in affecting how non-technical users see AI, the perceptions about AI? I think the media plays a huge role in hyping AI, and I think it does so in multiple ways. And I really try as an individual to counteract some of this, but I definitely sometimes feel like I add to this as well. I'm not perfect by any means. AI is very exciting. It's very spicy. So it's easy to associate a lot of things that aren't AI with AI because it just gets more clicks. Like people want to read about AI, they don't want to read about old school algorithms, or they don't want to read about statistics, which ultimately is basically what a lot of AI is. And so there's like that aspect of it. I think there's also a challenge where a lot of journalists who are writing about AI, that's not necessarily their beat. Unlike me, they might be general tech reporters, but they increasingly are required to write about the topic because it's just so pervasive in everything they themselves don't always know how to differentiate what is or isn't AI and journalists operate under very, very tight time crunches, deadlines, and you're really just trying to get stories out with as much accuracy as you can, but you can't sit and take time to learn an entire field before writing a story. So there's also that aspect of it. And then also, I think another aspect is for reporters that are specialized in covering AI, sometimes you end up like you have the hammer and you look for the nail where there are stories that you really shouldn't be covering from an AI or technical lens, but you do anyway, because there's some AI involved. And even if it's only like a peripheral thing, you make it the thing. I've definitely been guilty of all three of these things. (laughs) (laughs) And so I think that, that definitely feeds into the hype. But I really try to write about AI in a technical way. Like I I really strive to do that. And what I hope I'm doing when I achieve this goal is equipping people with the tools to critically think for themselves about what is and isn't AI when they encounter other hype in the world. So how do you wade through the hype? Right. So if a new academic research center says, hey, we've trained some algorithm, it's leaps and bounds better than anything anyone else has done before, it's going to revolutionize the world. Of course, everyone has an incentive to make themselves seem great. So what are some tactics that you use to, to wade through and try to figure out what's really going on and whether it's worth reporting on or not? Assuming that I don't know enough context to do this kind of rapid evaluation, I have a series of questions that I go through where, first of all, I'm always looking, I'm always looking at the research paper. But I also try to jump on a call with the researcher who's making the claims. And I'll ask them, where did you get the data? How are you cleaning the data? How is the data being processed in your algorithm? How are you building the algorithm? Like what tools are... I'm basically walking through every aspect of the machine learning pipeline and getting them to state to me very explicitly what they did. Mm -hmm. And when someone is genuinely doing AI research, they can answer all of those questions very clearly and explain why 
what they did was different or innovative compared to other people. Do you ever encounter hurdles where people want to claim rightfully or not that it's proprietary information and you just have to, to tr trust? Uh, then I don't write about it. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Fortunately, I don't encounter those situations a lot because I am mostly writing about research that is in paper form and meant to be open source. Mm -hmm. So the details are already laid bare. But I, what I always say is, look, I write for tech review and my readers want technical details. So if you can't provide them, I can't serve the reader by writing this story. Right. In some ways, it sounds like you're kind of being like a governing board for some of these folks, right? Like, okay, where's the data? Was it biased? Did you de-bias it? What did you do, right? Like these are, I mean, these are important questions that you shouldn't have to ask, but we should all as like practitioners be asking of ourselves. Yeah, that is totally questions that are, that you can live by regardless of how you interact with AI, whether you're the one creating it or the one purchasing it or the one interacting with it on your phone. You know, we're in a world these days where the news cycle, you know, the non-AI news cycle is pretty fast, pretty hyperbolic and can get really extreme really fast. So do you feel that AI reporting is equally hyperbolic or maybe less so than, you know, the regular non-AI news? And I mean, not just what you do, but generally the field of AI reporting. Yeah, I, I, I haven't really thought about this very much, but... My intuition is that it's more because of the gap in knowledge that people have in order to fully understand it and cover it well. And so it can be easy when you are time pressured and when you don't have that foundational knowledge to end up conflating a lot of concepts. Whereas there are many other things that journalists cover that are a lot more familiar and, and based on, on a lot more common concepts that we use day to day. So it's, it doesn't require such specialization. So in line with that, what is the trade-off for you? Or like, what is the middle ground when you're writing an article between being really accurate and hyper-specific at the risk of being kind of boring and too detail-y? What's the trade-off that you deal with, I guess? A writer is never writing alone. You have editors that are censoring you as well. So okay. I always err, maybe to the detriment of my editor, I always err on the side of more detail and then he will chop it out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when it gets too boring, he yeah. knows and I trust him, his sense in being able to figure out which details actually benefit people's understanding versus which details will just get people to X out the window. In general, I think the other thing is if I can't explain the concept, I'm always thinking about like, can I explain this concept to not a five-year-old, but you know, the saying like, say it like I'm five or whatever. I try to think about that when I'm writing something. And if I can't explain the concept to that level, because it starts getting like too much in the weeds, then that's usually when I'm like, okay, this is probably a little too much. Let me just dial it down and get it to a point where it's not inaccurate and it's not sensationalist, but it is also not like an academic paper. How do you go about upskilling technically? I mean, you were trained formally as an engineer, but the field rapidly evolves. And so what are some techniques you use? I think a lot of listeners to this podcast are people who maybe were not trained as CS engineers, but they're interested in AI, they're working tangential or in the space. What are some strategies that you employ? I think the strategies that I employ are probably going to be slightly different from the ones that other people employ in that 70% of my job is consuming information. Like I'm paid to just learn and keep up with this beat. But there are a few things. So when I first started covering this, I actually took an intro to machine learning course at General Assembly. And I did like their, I don't, I forget what it was like a 10 week intensive or whatever, and went through the motions of learning basic data science that other people might learn if they wanted to go into data science. And I also took a lot of online courses that were much less expensive. And once I started actually writing this, one of the fastest ways that I got up to speed was by reading papers. So mm -hmm. AI is awesome in that most of the papers are open source and they're all published on archive, arxiv.org. And so I would go on there every week and I would read five to 10 papers every week. 
And I would also be scanning through all of the paper titles to see like what topics were popping up with increasing frequency. And I would then focus on learning about those particular topics. And I also spent a lot of time looking online as well for there are a lot of people who have already done the heavy lifting of explaining certain concepts really, really well. Like there are certain YouTube channels, there's certain medium articles and other resources like that, that really lay out some of the foundational concepts of machine learning. And I just went and reviewed all of them. And I, and I also still, I have them all bookmarked to reference repeatedly when I need inspiration. What are some things that you think the academics or kind of the practitioners are ignoring and they should be focused more on? And what are some things that you think are out there in the wild that are occurring, but media is ignoring or underreporting on? I actually think the thing I'm about to say applies to both people, both groups of people. The biggest thing that AI researchers and AI reporters don't cover is how it impacts people. I mean, it's obvious why this happens. AI researchers are working in labs. They're really focused on the theoretical math of it all oftentimes, or the, the engineering, like how to actually implement this in practice. And they forget that the algorithms that they're building are actually, in some instances, sorting people's lives, like determining the fates of people's lives or helping determine at least. And there's not enough research on their part or to actually like go out and see it's, it's more than user research or like user experience research, right? It's like stakeholder research, going out and experiencing how the work that you're doing actually confronts the realities of society. I think one thing that we see a lot with a lot of like the more famous AI gone wrong, right, is like, one, how does something that's been done affect the immediate users? And then mm -hmm. how does it affect the people around them? Yeah. Yeah. And I think AI reporters do this too, where the, I struggle with this a lot. I have deadlines. I need to write a certain number of articles every week. And the easiest thing to do is to just talk with the researchers rather than find the people who are actually being affected by the algorithms. Those people are much harder to source and much harder to build relationships with. Whereas I can pick up the phone and dial a number of AI researchers at any given period of time. Essentially. You have written previously about the climate effects of AI, right? Which is to say, training these huge models actually puts out a ton of emissions and like CO2, CO2 emissions. And I've actually heard people then reference that article as like, oh my gosh, AI is like really bad for the environment and we should stop doing it. So how do you, I mean, like, how do you even respond to that, right? Like I've read the article myself and I say like, look, if you read the article, she's talking about super intense AI algorithms, not like your little like classification that you're running on a thousand records. Yeah. I mean, like, I guess just like, how do you even respond to that? I mean, it's, it's really hard. It's, it's as an individual, like there's definitely things that you can do, but there's also just systemic problems that you can't, no matter what you do, you can't fix it alone, I guess is my cop-out answer. We have a debate for every headline. Sometimes it's very clear cut, like someone says a headline, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And sometimes there's a serious back and forth of, well, is this accurate? But is, is this going to like catch people's eye? And then it goes back and forth and back and forth. And you try to refine it as best you can until you get to this like perfect balance of, okay, it's catchy enough, but it's not inaccurate. And hopefully people will read the story to get more context. But it's, it's really hard. It's, it, the other thing is like, you can only write within 70 characters Mm -hmm. for social media to, right. to optimize things for social media. And then you have SEO to deal with Google. It's like you're you're like trying to write in the confines of all of these different algorithms that you're trying to please. And at the end of the day, there's only so much you can do with 70 characters and all of the right SEO optimized words. So, wow. so I don't it, know. So they really, I mean, they really put themselves in this situation if you think about it, right? Or like AI... It's true. AI is it's AI, true. right? Like AI is guiding your articles about AI. It really is, yeah. And you do have a, a pulpit here, you know, being on the Banana Data podcast, you can speak to your readers. <laughs> what would you say to the public at large? Like, how do you wish that people went about tactically reading 
ML and AI journalism? Like, is there something that they're doing wrong, right? Should I be, for instance, should I be using Twitter? Should I not be using Twitter? How should I be a savvy <laughs> consumer of the work that you and others are producing? I mean, this is true of any, any journalism is just don't just read the headline. If a headline provoked you enough that you are going to start saying it at cocktail parties, <laughs> click on the damn article, read at least the first paragraph. Usually the first paragraph has enough context to get you by to be a lot more nuanced than just the headline. But like, obviously, the even better version is to read the entire article and then subscribe to <laughs> publications that write about this, these topics very well. You but, know, I am subscribed to the, the newsletter you put out, which is the, the algorithm. Is it called the algorithm? Yes. Yes. It's called wow. the algorithm. Look at that. I, I remembered the name correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, so I mean, I think it's interesting, right? Just especially because we, we have talked about some of your work on this podcast before. And that climate article, I hope you didn't go back and listen to the episode where we were like, Oh, no, this article seems inaccurate. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it wasn't so much, I think, in what you're reporting, but sort of the conclusions that become easy to draw, right? So even if someone yeah. does read this article or reads an article, and has a preset sort of notion of what they want to get out of it. I do think that that probably affects what the media's role is, right? Like you're not only yeah. a reporter, you're also a teacher. You're also a like guide in some ways. Yeah. With the climate article in particular, one thing that I really didn't have a good gauge of is because yeah, you're right. I am kind of a teacher. And one of the things that comes with a teaching profession is you also need to have a good gauge of where your students are at and what level they're at, what mm -hmm. preconceptions they have. And one of the things that I kind of underestimated is, or sorry, I overestimated the reader's ability to discern some of the nuances and I should have spelled some things out more explicitly. So a piece of feedback that I got repeatedly after that article was you really didn't make clear that this is the training of the models, not the use of the models. Oh yeah, for sure. They were right. Like I, I assumed that if I just said training AI again and again and again, that that itself would make it clear. But I realized I also needed to provide a counterfactual and say, but by the way, this is not the use of AI. And that kind of like when to give extra information, when to withhold it really does rely on, on my ability to keep a pulse on how the public understands things as well. So in that particular instance, I, I overestimated the distinction that people had in their mind between the two. That's a that's super interesting, right? Because that's not something you would even really think about. You know, people say, oh, AI is like causing all this stuff. And it's like, well, hold on. Let's interrogate your statement. First of all, did you read the first paragraph of this article? Like, what are you trying <laughs> to actually say? So so there's an opportunity here for you and people in your industry to be a bridge between AI researchers and the public kind of writ large. What do you think each of those sides needs to do to make that job easier for you? Well, I guess I would just ask for kindness from both sides. Like AI researchers should be more generous with their time to explain to journalists their work, because at the end of the day, we are trying to do a public service and get their work in front of more people and improve the general understanding of what they're doing. And a lot of researchers are really great at this, but other times it can be hard to really get that kind of generosity. And I think for the public, it's like when you're reading an article, if you think that there are inaccuracies or things like that, just be thoughtful about providing that critical feedback without being demeaning. So, you know, we're still at the start of 2020 here. What are you most jazzed or excited about going into this new year? The thing that I'm most excited about is I feel there's been a genuine shift in the way that AI practitioners have started talking about ethics. I, I really do. I, and I have not been covering this space for very long, but it's already been so clear of a difference between two years ago and this year. In that, first of all, people even acknowledge the fact that ethics is a thing. <laughs> and second of all, they're seriously starting to engage with, oh, what does it mean to actually practice ethics and not just espouse ethics? And I am really excited about that. And I hope that I can continue writing articles that will help with that momentum. 
yeah, that's definitely something that we care about a lot on this podcast and, and at Data IQ. So I'm sure you'll see more of that coming out soon. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Karen. This has been a great conversation. And I think Will and I have learned a lot. Thanks so much for joining the podcast today. Thank you for having me. And I hope the next conversation is soon. Great. Right. <laughs> Today's Banana Fact is about Dr. Seuss, the children's author that many of us read growing up. So Green Eggs and Ham was actually written because of a bet. So Dr. Seuss's editor, Bennett Cerf, actually bet him that he wouldn't be able to write a book that uses only 50 unique words. But lo and behold, he did. And it's one of the best-selling Dr. Seuss books. Wow. Talk about constrained optimization. <laughs> That's all we've got for today in the world of banana data. We'll be back with another podcast in two weeks. But in the meantime, subscribe to the Banana Data newsletter to read these articles and more like them. We've got links for all the articles we discussed today in the show notes. All right. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure, Tavani. It's been great, Will. See you next time. <laughs>